So even though this was a success, the scale is, is, is the big surprise. Because to get these results, you know, from something 36 inches away, uh, uh, at, at 25 miles away, it's just an unbelievable amount of power. And especially since it it's actually has to penetrate a metal cage, a metal airframe, to do its damage. Although Jafari's encounter was witnessed by many, and he claimed the Iranian military is interested in the UFO phenomenon, just three years later, the Iranian Revolution created a closed and secret society within Iran. Reports of UFOs were no longer coming to the West. I haven't seen it anything like this before, and uh, what I think and I, what I believe and everybody else believed it, that was an unknown foreign object, a UFO. After putting the three main components of Jafari's case to the test, the team doubts that a man-made flying object could mimic the movements that Jafari saw that night. And while the sudden loss of the F-4's computer system can be explained by the intense electromagnetic pulse, the real facts remain elusive. But four years later, a similar and even more dramatic UFO dogfight occurs over Peru. But this time, the pilot was able to attack. On February 18, 2008, Oscar Santa Maria arrives at Los Angeles International Airport from Lima, Peru. Santa Maria is in Los Angeles to work with the UFO hunters to help prove the facts and events around his extraordinary case of a UFO dogfight over Peru in 1980. Oscar Santa Maria Huertas, official piloto de la... I am Oscar Santa Maria Huertas, a pilot for the uh, Peruvian Air Force, right now in retirement. El 11 de abril de 1980, the 11th of April of 1980, a las 7 y 15 horas de la mañana, at 7.15 in the morning, en la base era at la, the air base of La Jolla in Peru, los 1800 hombres, 1800 military people in charge that day, observaron al final de la pista, they observed at the end of the runway a, an object that looked like a uh, balloon, no tenía permiso that didn't have authorization vuelo, to fly it in the area. Suponíamos que podría ser un aparato espía. And they thought it was an spy. El comando de la base. A commander gave him the order to uh, take off and destroy the object right away. Santa Maria fires 64 rounds from his 30 millimeter cannon directly at the object. But to his amazement, the bullet seemed to pass right through the object and would have clearly destroyed anything in their path, including a weather balloon. He was expecting the object to explode. Pero no fue así, e inició un ascenso. But it didn't happen, and the object started ascending. A he proceeded to uh, go after the object. Santa Maria pursues and notices the unidentified object is doing something else. Every time he gets within range, the object climbs, executing maneuvers worthy of top gun. However, the most harrowing part of his story is yet to come, and it involves the U.S. military. I just recently met Oscar Santa Maria, and uh, I listened to his story, and I have to wonder, why would this military commander come out with this UFO story unless he was really, really affected by this experience? I believe he saw something that really shook him and that stayed with him to this day. Due to the complexity and shocking nature of this event, Oscar Santa Maria has always encountered skeptics who simply cannot believe that both he and this object made such extraordinary maneuvers during his dogfight with what he thinks was a real UFO. The team wants to determine if the Santa Maria UFO had maneuvering capabilities that were greater than anything that existed at the time. Since they don't have access to a Sukhoi 22 jet, they will use the next best thing available. They return to Air Combat USA to take this case to the sky. 
The team has identified three key elements of this case that they want to test and demonstrate. The fact that Santa Maria locked onto and fired at the UFO with no effect is incredibly impressive to the team, but difficult to test. However, two key aerial maneuvers can be analyzed with some accuracy in the air. First, the UFO came to a dead stop in midair. Second, from this dead stop, the UFO began a steep, fast climb. In order to give the team an accurate depiction of the events of that night, experiments producer John Tyndall has devised a laser tracking tool with two lasers, one red, one green, both controlled by joysticks. The green laser represents the flight path of the UFO. The red laser represents the flight path of the jet. Together, they give a scale representation of the event. Hey, John. Good. How about that? Yeah. Okay. What I have here is a, uh, a, a top-down view using these, uh, these laser pointers um, as a, basically a, a scale model of, of the movement of any of these UFOs and, and the aircraft, respectively. Um, I can scale the movement uh, to, to, to match the speed of the uh, scale on the map. Where was your airfield? The red laser is uh, indicating your air aircraft, and that is traveling at around 1,000 miles an hour. Santa Maria, using the red laser, shows his position at the point of the first attack. Cintometros got closer and to the 900-meter fire position. He fired 64 rounds. He knows that he hit the object, but nothing happened. It exploded. The object started moving away. At a fast pace. Yes, as he moved away, he climbed at the same time. The object stopped all, all of a sudden. He almost hit it, so he went around his right to take a firing position. As he was getting close to the 900 meter range, he activated the post combat. Is it afterburner? Afterburner, post combustion. Yes, all, all of a sudden, the object climbed once again. The most amazing part of this story is that once he goes to afterburners, the UFO makes an evasive move straight up, and Santa Maria yanks back and starts to fly up as well, now traveling at over 1,000 miles per hour. But incredibly, the UFO stops in midair, and after he passes, the UFO follows him, accelerating from a dead stop. An impossible maneuver. So he was doing the uh, supersonic speed, and he passed the object. The object went, uh, then started climbing next to him. They're both climbing roughly vertically. Then what? At 19,000 meters, he couldn't climb no more, and he was practically floating. At 19,000 meters, just over 62,000 feet, Santa Maria began to lose control of his plane. The Su-22 has a ceiling of 60,000 feet and could no longer operate at this altitude. Without a capacity to attack one last time, he, he started getting back to the base. After briefing the pilots on his specific flight plan and maneuvers, Baron, Joker, Ted, and Bill Scott prepare for takeoff to demonstrate the details of this strange engagement. 